everybody. Thank you guys for um, taking some time this evening for yourselves to talk about skin cancer prevention and sun safety. We'll go over um, a whole lot today. I haven't been back in about, it's been like four years since my last talk on skin cancer and sun safety. So there have been some new things that have popped up over the past couple years. So we'll keep this as up to date as possible. And then after the presentation, you are more than welcome to try out the derma scan. I'll show you a picture on here what that looks like. Oh. But this is not diagnostic. You don't have to be worried about that. <laughs> this is just for you to check your own sun damage if you have any. And it would basically look like tons of freckles on your face in the areas that you may or may not have sun damage. So we'll talk about that later, but you kind of keep it in the back of your mind if you want to participate in that you're more than welcome to. So I work for Chester County Health Department. I'm one of the health educators in chronic disease and injury prevention. So I'm basically a traveling health teacher. I hop anywhere in Chester County. It can be community-based. It can be school-based. I was with kindergartners all morning <laughs> in West Chester, so it's very fun. And of course, seasonally, skin cancer is you know a topic that we, we typically cover all throughout the summer, starting in May, because May is uh, Melanoma Month and Skin Cancer Awareness Month. Okay, so let's talk about how skin cancer is a little bit different than other types of cancer. The main one is that the skin is our largest organ in the body. Okay. It covers us head to toe and it completely absorbs what we put on our skin, including the UVA and the UVB rays that are shining down from the sun. Our skin is gonna absorb that too. Now the difference here is you can see skin cancer since it is on the outside of your body. This is visual. Whereas other cancers, of course, that are more embedded in your organs inside your body, it's going to be hard maybe to know that they are there or to catch them in an early stage. The three types of skin cancer that I'm going to go over today are the more frequently known ones that we hear a little bit more, especially this time of year with it being Skin Cancer Month, okay? So that's basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and then melanoma. Who's heard of melanoma before? Usually if, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> so we have an educated crowd already. So yeah, we'll go through those and I do wanna pass out our models so you can kind of see what these guys look like. Okay, there are definitely some visual variations here between the different types of skin cancer. And I'll pass this around so you can take a look. But when you do see it, please note that only one mole on here is non-cancerous, okay? And that is the top right. This one, and they're all labeled so you can see. But the top right is a non-cancerous mole, and then you can kind of look through to see what the other ones are, okay? And feel free to take pictures of this on your phone, you're more than welcome to, okay? Yeah. So let's start with our basal cell carcinoma. This does make up the majority of our skin cancers. And we see this typically on areas of the body that are heavily exposed to the sun. Okay, so that makes sense. So the back of the hands and then the neck up is typically where you see most of the basal cells. The good news is with skin cancer, especially basal cell, is it tends to stay localized. So it tends to not spread as easily, which is good because we know that when cancer spreads, it's in a later stage. So that doesn't mean that you can just leave this be. You will have to get it taken care of if you have it. And depending on where that is on your body and where that's located, that could be something very simply done at your dermatologist's office, or that could be, you know, like an outpatient visit or a Mohs surgery or something, you know, that maybe has, you know, a couple extra steps to it, okay? But what are we looking for with our basal cell? So we're looking for shiny or waxy raised bumps. You can kind of see that both of those examples there are on someone's face. So again, areas that are exposed to the sun. And you definitely want to take note of open sores, red patches, or scars, okay? A really good rule of thumb is that if you have a cut or a scar or a bruise or something that's not healing, then something is probably going on with those skin cells and you're going to want to take note of that and visit your doctor about that. Okay, so any cuts or open sores or anything that are oozing or bleeding or any of that, we wanna kind of keep that in the back of our mind, a little bit of a red flag. And same with our squamous cell carcinoma. So these are our second most frequent 
of um, skin cancers. And again, they do tend to stay localized, just like that basal cell that we talked about. Now, these look a little bit different. You can kind of see that on the model, too, that's getting passed around. These pictures here, they're a little bit wart-like, a little crustier, okay? Maybe like a little, little scaly. All right, and again, if they're bleeding or open sores, those would be things you'd, you know, you'd want to <coughs> talk with your doctor about. And the big thing that we're going to, going to hone in on is if your mole used to look one way and it's changed over time and starts to look like something else, that's a really big red flag and um, you know, something's going on with those skin cells. Okay, now melanoma, we don't have as much melanoma as we do the other types of skin cancers that I just showed you, but this is the more deadly of our skin cancers because it actually starts deeper in the layers of our skin. So if we think about it, if your skin cancer is on the top and it's you know, a little bit more localized, it's going to be easier to get taken care of. But if it starts deeper in our skin cells and it's close to the bloodstream, what can happen? It can spread much more easily than our other types. So that's why we lose more people from melanoma. Okay, but I do want to kind of just remind everybody that this can be visual and there's a lot of things that we can do to prevent this from happening that we're going to really touch on today. The one thing that can be kind of tricky about melanoma is that sometimes they're called hidden melanomas. Has anybody heard that term before? For example, melanoma could be in your eyelid or on the bottom of your foot or say in like a nail bed, like a fingernail or a toenail. Those would maybe be places that you wouldn't, you know, apply sunscreen or you might not check for abnormalities or changes. So that can be kind of a, a tricky thing here with melanoma. And that's also why it's so great to have a dermatologist. We'll talk about that because that's the doctor that's really gonna check you head to toe and, and monitor and look for those hidden ones, okay? So this does look a little bit different than our basal and our squamous cell carcinomas. Okay, you can see this is much darker than melanoma is. So typically black, maybe, um, maybe like a little bit red, which you can kind of see on the model that got put around. And um, when we're talking about the hidden melanomas in like the nails, that would probably be like a dark streak. And think about it this way. If you've ever like banged your hand, bruised a nail before, does that grow out? It does. This wouldn't be growing out, okay? It would like still be there. So you talk to your doctor about that, okay? And then any changing freckles or age spots. That really is the big thing, the evolution of our moles. Did they start one way and are they morphing into something else? Okay. I love this new campaign uh, from the CDC, The Burning Truth. A base tan is not a safe tan. Don't get burned by tanning myths. And that is so true. I mean, who's heard like, gotta go get, you know, get my base tan before my vacation or mm -hmm. before summer hits. But we really want to you know, keep in mind that anytime the sun is changing our skin color, it's damage. So it doesn't matter if you go out and you just fry. That's what happens. Like I burn, that's my shade is red. <laughs> okay, that's obviously gonna be sun damage. Or sometimes people will go out and you know, their freckles pop out. That's still sun damage. Or maybe you go out and you tan great. It's still damaged. So anytime the sun is changing our skin color, it, it's damaged. It, we just all kind of react to it a little bit differently, if that makes sense. And our gene pool has a lot to do with that, okay? So there are you know, specific causes for diseases, and there's always that little genetic factor that you really can't change. So about 10% is, is what you're born with, all right? You can't, can't do anything about that. Um, meaning our hair color, our eye color, our skin color, you know, just our genetic makeup in, in general, okay? So that's already accounted for, but what we can change is our sun exposure, okay? So who remembers being a kid and getting a really bad burn? I've had them too, <laughs> like the blistering ones, no, where no. the red bubbles, I mean, I was, because I all I do is burn, so if I don't reapply my sunscreen, which, you know, a oh, teenager would forget to do at the beach, you know, the one time a year I used to go in the summer, and 
Uh, I mean, I, I still, I have like certain spots, like freckling age spots and things like that from those blisters and those burns. And I mean, I have to be really careful about that now. But under the age of 18, technically, for childhood sunburns, it dramatically increases your risk for skin cancer later. It really does. So if you have any little ones in your life, you do want to make sure that they're covered for the summer with, um, you know, rash guards, um, hats, sunscreen. We'll talk all about that stuff. All right, now obviously tanning. Uh, tanning beds, none of that is going to be good. I mean, just one visit to a tanning bed is basically equivalent to a whole beach day without any sunscreen, okay? No, 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 we don't want to do that. And it was a couple years ago, I want to say either 2014 or 2015, that most states regulated tanning, so you have to be 18 to go tanning. I remember when back in high school, you know, under the age of 18, my friends would go a lot, like before prom and stuff, and now you're really not allowed unless you have a, a write-off from a parent or a guardian for that. Now, um, so again, so we have kind of our sun exposure, which we can, you know, help monitor a little bit. The one part that we can is age, okay? Get another day older every day, cumulative time in the sun. So if you remember when I was talking about the basal and the squamous cell carcinomas, they're typically on areas that get hit by the sun a lot. Well, as you get older, your risk for that is just going to increase a little bit, just like it does for, for lots of, of different health issues. Okay. All right. And then again, the genetics, you know, we're, we're born with that, so we've got to work with what we, with what we have. Okay. So some other risk factors are going to be your pigmentation in general. Yes. I just um, heard that people with um, lighter color eyes yeah. are more likely uh, to become um, to become victims, I guess, of, of the heavy sunburn yeah. and therefore yeah. the the, uh, the cancers. Yeah, yeah. The lighter pigmentation, you do have a little bit of a higher risk. Yeah. You do. Another risk factor is actually the number of moles that you have on your body. Okay, that's another thing you really don't have any control over, right? But if you just naturally, you know, have like more than 40 or 50 moles, it just means that there's a little bit more of an opportunity to happen to one of them. Okay? And then people that burn easily are more sun sensitive, like if they have lighter pigmentation, that would happen. Okay, so that's a risk factor. Now, some other things would be the medications that you're taking. There are tons of medicines where if you take it, you really shouldn't go out in the sun because you're a high risk for a burn. So this is a great time of year to review whatever meds you're on and make sure that you're not in that boat. And if you are, you know, we have some precautions that we'll, that we'll talk about. And you can always um, bring that up to your, to your doctors as well. Okay, now this... Um, this might seem obvious, but if you've had any type of cancer in the past, you're always a little bit higher risk for developing a different one. So that is kind of a risk factor as well, all right? Not necessarily skin cancer, could have been a, a different one too, okay? All right, so how exactly is this working, all right? It's the ultraviolet radiation that's coming down from the sun. It's so far away, yet it hits us so hard, and it can hit us just within like a couple of minutes, okay? I'll talk about that UV index in a few slides. So we've got the UVA, the UVB, and the UVC. Right now at the ozone layer, we don't have to worry about UVC, so we'll just focus on the A and the B, all right? So UVA, you can see from the picture there, that penetrates deeper into the skin, okay? Goes further down, and we call that A for aging. So the early signs of aging, the wrinkles, the age spots that are associated with um, sun exposure. So that's what we think of with the UVA, and we call the UVB for burn, because that hits the top layer of the skin and causes that really uncomfortable sunburn, okay? So together, or separately, those can cause skin cancer. Now what's really cool is all of our sunscreens are now broad spectrum. Do you, have you guys seen that on your packaging that you've been getting? Back in, um, I guess, 2011, the FDA re-regulated sunscreen, so a handful of years ago, and they made it broad spectrum. So that means it blocks out, absorbs, and reflects the UVA and the UVB rays. <coughs> so even more important to use your sunscreen now because it's more effective than it was when we were younger. It's just 
working better now. It's broad spectrum, okay? So that's how that works. Now, if everybody wants to take a look at your Prevent Skin Cancer Worksheet, if you flip it over, you'll have the visual of these moles right there on your sheet. So we'll talk about the ABC self-check. So this is what is encouraged for you to do on a personal level. Oh, here, I can't have that from you. Sorry, I left you hanging with that. <laughs> so <laughs> what we encourage people to do on a personal level is be aware of what moles you have, okay? Might sound a little a little silly. You're like, oh, it's been there forever. But has it always looked like that? Has it always been that size or that shape or that color? That's what we want to take note of, the evolution of the moles. So they call it the ABC check because it just goes down the ABC. So A is for asymmetry, okay? If you folded your mole in half, would one half look like the other, okay? Ideally, your mole would be symmetrical. If it's not, that would be something to talk to your doctor about. B is for border. Is your border regular? Is it a perfect circle? Or is it super jagged, kind of like a puzzle piece? All right? So you'd want it to be regular if your border is irregular. Yeah. What if you just have tan ones like that? But they're not black. What do you mean? Like, like a, like like a freckle? Like a, like, a, like a mole like object, but, but tan, not black. Oh, okay, yeah, that's that's okay. You will get to color in just a minute. Yeah, you mean the color of the, the of the, the mole, mole or the yeah. circle? Okay. Yeah, so when it comes to color, we don't want our moles to be looking like a rainbow. <laughs> okay. So you can kind of see if you look here, there's several different colors in here. We've got some red, we got some pink, some navy, a little bit of black brown in there. Your your moles really should just be one color and they should ideally stay that color. So if they were one color and they changed into a different color or now all of a sudden it's, you know, shades of different colors, that would be something to look into with your doctor, okay? D is for diameter, and that is referring to is your mole larger than the size of a pencil eraser, okay? Now the really important one here is E, and that's for the evolution of all these moles. So if your mole started out here, I'm going to hop over. If the mole started out like this, great. You do your, you know, your self-check. It's really best to do that in the bathroom. The lighting tends to be better. It's maybe a little bit more convenient if you're about to take a bath or a shower or something just to kind of be aware of the moles. So say it started like that, and the next month you check it, and you're like, hmm, well, it's like a little bit bigger. I thought it was a perfect circle. Now it's not. All right, the next month you're like, wow, a couple more colors are coming in there. All right, you see where I'm going with this? It's evolving over time. And that, you know, something's going on with the skin cells there with that mole. So you'd want to get that checked out by your doctor and figure out next steps with that. So that's what the E is for, the evolution. Actually, I think that that's like the most important one. I mean, you want to take note of A through D, but really, if it's changing, this is where that important piece is that you want to catch as soon as possible. So if you look um, at your detect skin cancer sheet here, you see, um, you know, number one is what we just covered. Number two is that skin self exam. So they are actually showing you there how to check yourself for moles. You know, what if you live by yourself? Maybe a little hard to see if something's on your back. You can see this person using a little mirror to see if anything's going on back there. Number three, you see someone checking the bottom of their feet, maybe for like a hidden melanoma. Okay, so this is kind of how you do it. And then what they have for three, and at the bottom here is, um, you can actually use this paper to track your own moles if you would like to. Okay. So this is a really key part in just being aware of, of what's on your body and if it is changing over time. Okay. The second part to this is going to the dermatologist. Okay. So um, working in Chester County, you know, we have tons of doctors in Chester County. And I travel all throughout the county, but it's always really, really surprising to me how many people just don't have a dermatologist and how many people, adults, have never been to one before in their entire lives. So let's kind of roll through 
how this would go. The dermatologist is the skin doctor, okay? So they'll do with it, you know, anything from hair, skin, and nail issues, rosacea, eczema, acne, to obviously skin cancer too. They'll check all of that kind of stuff. And this is the doctor where you should have an annual visit. It is recommended to go one time per year. Now, of course, if you are someone that's already been impacted by skin cancer on a personal level, then you might have a more frequent visitation schedule. Okay, you know, for example, one of my friends back when we were in grad school had melanoma on her face. So she had to get a skin graft from her thigh onto her cheek. She was in radiation all summer. So obviously, you know, she was at the dermatologist very often. I was not. I did my annual appointment, and I will continue to do so unless something happens and I'm told otherwise. So that's kind of how the visitation goes. Visitations are often difficult to get if you don't have a history with the doctor. Yeah, they I, are. I needed to get to a dermatologist, yeah. not for a cancerous thing at that moment, but for something of a rash that I didn't have before the yeah. spray and, yeah. and and I I was worried about it. And I called probably eight dermatologists in this area. Mm -hmm. I would have to wait a month to see the or, or two. More. Yeah. yeah, or two. Or yeah, more. that is a really yeah. good point. Yeah. These people <laughs> fill <laughs> up fast. They do. That's why it's so good to be in a routine of already going once a year because you're already in. They have your stuff. If you and then if an emergency pops up, they'll fit you in. So let's um let's go over that because what, it can be challenging. Yeah. What I found that works better is no, I shouldn't say better. Okay. It's okay. I go to. I have. I've had skin cancer frequently, we'll say, okay. at, at lower levels, okay, basal yeah. and squibus. But um, I wound up starting with a dermatologist and went after that to a plastic surgeon. Oh, yeah. And, and then the plastic surgeon is now the one who checks me for the cancer. Yeah. And he'll check every year. Yeah. But when I had a real dermatology problem, you know, like who wants to live for two months with skin that's so itchy that you think you're going to go insane? You know? Right. And, uh, but n no, I couldn't get in a month or two. You know, was... Yeah, that is a good point. Um, plastic surgeons, you know, you always have the option depending on where your skin cancer is. If you don't want your dermatologist to remove it, you can have a plastic surgeon remove it. I mean, obviously this is on the outside of your body. There could be scarring and their specialty is in making that as, you know, look as perfect as possible, you know, depending on where they can. So, you know, say you have basal cell carcinoma and it's somewhere neck up, you know, you could obviously use a plastic surgeon that specializes neck up surgeries. So they could kind of become your new person to make sure that that's okay. Yeah, that can. But for just regular kind of dermatology purposes, the um, what I think the easiest way to find one, if you don't already have one, is going through your insurance provider. So <coughs> say you have Independence Blue Cross or you have you know Aetna, Keystone, whatever it is, you can go on their website or call whoever your network person is with your insurance and you can search for any type of doctor in whatever zip code you'd like to search in and whoever takes your insurance will populate. I find that to be easier for people because it's a little less confusing than doing cold calls, you know, when you're put on hold and like, do you take my insurance? Like, oh, don't, I just wasted 10 minutes with you. So that can be a little bit easier. Another option is the American Academy of Dermatology website, which if we want to switch over to the sunscreen sheet, I have right down here. So at the bottom right corner, you have that little box with <coughs> two icons. The AAD website is great, and you can do a search. I think I have it on the <coughs> slide. This is what it looks like. So I, um, I recently presented in Malvern, so I just did the search for Malvern, not that that's <coughs> far from here. So <coughs> since I'm on the dermatology website, I'm searching for obviously a dermatologist, <laughs> but if you were on your insurance provider website, you could do this for a cardiologist, you could do this you know, for any type of doctor. And you can either type in your zip code or your location, and they'll populate, and I have to say, I did a screenshot of this, but this has been down for pages and pages and pages. There's you know 
tons of doctors in this area and you know it'll give you the mileage so that's another way now if you haven't been to anyone in more than three years and you don't have coverage or have a doctor you can also utilize the spot skin cancer that's down here at the bottom right so that's spotskincancer.org and they will sometimes have pop-up skin cancer checks Okay, so I have to say it's just for skin cancer. Usually a doctor will send like their PA or someone to do it. It's like a 10 or 15 minute appointment and it's just to check the moles. So it's not for any other skin or health related issue. But they tend to have them, you know, here, usually Paoli Hospital, Lankanaw, typically the mainline health locations will have little pop-ups. And this is really the time of year that they will do them. It's very hard to find one throughout the winter months because you know they're trying to do it more so seasonally. So this is a you know a great site to look at as well. Um, so they check your moles at your home, and and check like how do they determine what's good and what's bad? So it's kind of like a mini dermatology appointment, only it's just the skin cancer check. And they, you will make an appointment and you will, you will go to it. It's like 10 or 15 minutes long. And, and they're doctors, so they're able to figure out what mole is normal versus what maybe looks suspicious. And then or lead you to the next step. Yeah, if something, you know, needed additional attention, then they would make you, like, a, an appointment with the doctor at their actual office, not just the little pop-up clinic that might be at one of the local, you know, clinics or hospitals, but actually at their, at their appointment. Yeah, so this is a great resource. Um, I think last year they had one. You know how Mainline Health built the new um, Concordville? locations down in Glen Mills it's a little bit of a drive from here but they do a lot of them at the mainline health locations and we're lucky to be relatively close to a lot of them so there should be some popping up so um so hopefully that makes sense you can use spot skin cancer if you don't have insurance or haven't been to someone in three years you can use the American Academy of Dermatology website or you could go through your insurance provider those are really the three main ways um, if you have a family member that already has an in with a dermatologist. I know, I hate to put it that way, but that does tend to work. Sometimes you'll call them and be like, oh, we're not taking new patients. You're like, well, my sister goes here. And they're like, okay, what's your name? <laughs> and then they'll, they, they often do fit you in if you have family. So that's another, another angle, okay? But hopefully, you know, if you don't have one yet, this, this is the time of year that there is probably a little bit of a wait. <laughs> but don't be too discouraged. If you can get in somewhere, you know, please do. And of course, if you're having an emergency, you know, go to your regular doctor, your PCP, your primary care, and they can also help you get to another doctor, okay? They can kind of override some of those cold calls. All right, so let's talk a little bit about outdoor time, especially this season <coughs> now that we're kind of like approaching the muggy weather, the really blazing sun, and basically summer in general. So 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. is hot. We know that, you didn't need me to point it out, <laughs> but how hot does it get? Well, the thing is you can actually check this. Remember how a few slides ago we looked at the UVA rays, A for aging and then the UVB, B for burn? Well, the UV index, which will either be on the Weather Channel or you can check it on your Weather app, tells you just how strong are those UVA and UVB rays that day? How likely are you to get a burn? And how, uh, how many minutes will you be outside before you start to burn? Okay, so if we kind of look over here, this is just a little snapshot. Look, this is not today. I know it says Thursday. <laughs> this is not today, mm -hmm. okay? But um, the UV index on whatever day this was was a 10. It's real high. Okay, 10's high, that's hot, that, that's burn, burn, burn. Okay, you have to protect yourself on a 10. All right, so it's saying that the peak sun time is 1.30. As you can imagine, afternoons are hot, that's no surprise. But what's the burn time? 10 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes. 10 minutes for anybody or just... I mean, yeah, it's, it's general. Okay. It's general, 10 minutes. But again, everyone handles that 10 minutes a little bit different. Some people will actually show burn 
in 10 minutes some people might just get a little glow <laughs> you know everybody's a little bit different but um, with that UV index at that peak time the burn would be like 10 minutes okay so that's that that's a rough day those are days where we have to seek shade and definitely make sure you're hydrated keep a water bottle with you throughout the summer if you're not it's just a good practice in general if you're not doing that already yeah. Does it really have to be hot to get a summer? I mean, it doesn't. It, it does not have to be super hot. It's really just about the sun um, and, and how it's so coming down. Like today where it was overcast. I didn't check the UV today, so I don't know what it was, but it's funny, we were chatting before we started and I was saying, you know, I was at the Poconos over the weekend and it was poor weather out, like kind of hazy. And I was only kayaking for an hour. And I actually did get a just little, little red around my neck. I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. You know, so it really is good to start to start checking. Of course, hard to check in the Poconos. Don't really have much service there. <laughs> it's hard to check the, the index, but I should know better. I think it depends on where you are, too, because as a child, the worst sunburn I ever had was down the shore on a cloudy day. Yeah, and I can I remember it so very clearly. Yeah. Uh, because, and it was tremendously overcast because it was a day when Hurricane Hazel was passing by. Mm -hmm. And we had yeah. rain all week, with, with one day exception. And that's the day we all got some poison. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the beach might have a different index than, than we have. So you want to check like, your local weather or the weather app for where you actually are. But this is a great practice to start, you know, doing this summer if you can. And again, you know, it, we only have so much control over our schedules, but if you're like, oh, I really want to get out there and garden, maybe don't do it at 1.30 on the UV index of 10 day, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, doing it a little bit earlier in the morning when it's still kind of, you know, somewhat cool out, or <coughs> doing it this time of night when the sun's, you know, going to be working its way down and isn't directly beaming ahead of us. Those are the times, if you can manip manipulate your schedule a little bit, that really is best. Okay. All right, let's go into some of the, um, you know, we won't get too fashion forward here, but some stuff that we can do for sun protection and safety. So the first thing is wear a hat. Now, any hat is better than none, okay? But a baseball cap, if you think about it, it really just covers right here. Mm -hmm. So your nose and your ears and your neck are still very much exposed. Better than nothing, but not ideal. <coughs> ideal would be a wide brimmed hat. So your whole face and neck truly are covered. So if that's possible, wear that, especially on those higher UV index days where you might have to be outside. And now if you think about it, the sun is shining directly down on us. So the first thing that it hits is our tippy top most point, and that's our head. And then next up are the nose and the ears because they protrude from the face. So that's why we see so much freckling on the nose and on lips and on ears a lot too. So really that hat is, is a great change if you haven't been using one, pick one up if you can. Sunglasses, not just a fashion statement, okay, they really do block out some of the UV lights. You, you'll know they're marketed that way if you're buying a pair of that has that implementation in there. And they can also help prevent cataracts and the hidden melanomas that could form in the eye or in the eyelid. Okay, so wear your sunnies. Next up is layer clothing. You know, this can be challenging depending on the temperature outside. But if you can cover up a little bit your arms or at least your shoulders, having a layer on makes it harder for the rays to get through your clothing and penetrate through and affect your skin. So that's really the point of keeping some clothes on if possible. Now let's talk about the sunscreen, okay? You have a whole how to select a sunscreen guide. Um, the most important thing is having a sunscreen and then actually using it, okay? You're yeah. like, oh, I put some on in the morning, but you know, I went back out at two and oh, I fried. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, yeah, you're going to if you're not reapplying it. You really do have to look at the directions. Sure. Does it make a difference if it's the spray-on kind or the rubbing? It on? shouldn't. You should get the kind that works for you, like smell, texture, all of that. You want to make sure that you like it. Um, 
The only issue that happens with the sprays is sometimes it, if you're spraying outside and it's windy, it could just kind of blow away. You might not be totally applying it, whereas if you're doing a lotion, you really have to. So with the sprays, you still might want to kind of lotion it and pat it, pat it in with your hands. Make sure you really are applying it. But um, the, the sunscreen stick versus the spray versus the lotion is really all up to the customer. Whatever it is that you feel comfortable using is fine. What is really important is the SPF, the sun protective factor. So we want that to be at least 30. That really is recommended because SPF 30 will block out, absorb, and reflect about 92% of the UV rays. It's pretty good. Okay, there's, there's really no 100 that would be staying inside. Okay, mm -hmm. but um, I don't want people to feel like they have to pay more for like an SPF 80 or something. If it's like a price difference, you really don't need to. It's not doing that much more. So, you know, 30 to 50 is great. If you find something you like and it's 70, that, that's great too, but don't feel like you have to hunt around too much. The big behavior change here is using it as directed. Okay, so some sunscreens will last 60 minutes, some might last 90 minutes. So if you think about it, you really do have to reapply your sunscreen pretty often. And if we look down here, we see that little shot glass, an ounce of sunscreen, okay? Enough to fill a shot glass is what would be used to cover like the average person's body. But if that only lasts 90 minutes, to fill up another one and do it again. So if you're having a whole beach day, you're gonna go through a good amount of sunscreen. So I always kind of laugh because people are like, oh yeah, I have my sunscreen from last year. It doesn't sound like you used it. <laughs> is it really for more than a year? I've heard that not. Um, there is an expiration date. It could be, you just have to check to make sure it's not expired. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but I don't want to forget about the, the UPF clothing. This is great if you're golfing, gardening, sending some kiddos off to summer camp or anything. You can purchase clothing that has some sun protection added in. It doesn't mean you're not going to put sunscreen on your face or put it, you know, if you're wearing shorts, put it on your legs. You're still going to do that. But this is really helpful for people that have to be outside for longer periods of time, okay? Like those beach days, camps, gardens, things like that. You can get those at um, outdoor stores. There's brands like Solar Tax, Coolie Bar. They're, they're out there, okay? All right, some sunscreen do's and don'ts. Who knew it came with this, this many rules? <laughs> it really does. So we did talk about this. You wanna use like SPF 30 to 50, okay? Just to make sure it's at least 30, all right? That's, that's really good. Um, and then reapply frequently. You do have to look at the, the label for details. There is no um, waterproof or sweat proof. If you are visibly drenched, the, the sunscreen is going to come off with you and you should reapply afterwards. So if you did take a little swim when you get back out, put it on again. Or if you are you know, really exerting yourself outside and you are sweating, you're going to have to reapply again. Okay. If you have any allergies or sensitivities or reactions to things, always look at the ingredient list. I really kind of compare it to food shopping. Mm -hmm. You know how you turn over the label and you look at what's in your food, your box of you know pasta, or whatever it is that you're buying. You can do that with all of your beauty products too. Make sure that that's going to work for you. And if you have any specifications or concerns, you know, asking your dermatologist is a really great idea. It's nice, it's nice to have one, okay? Let's talk about some don'ts. You're not gonna use sunscreen on infants, all right? Because they're not supposed to be outside. <laughs> all right, they should not be in direct sunlight at all. If you think about, you know how like if you get a cut and you have a scar and it, it, that skin looks a little bit different, it's so fresh mm -hmm. and that skin is so brand new, it's like baby skin. Okay, so that is really sensitive to sun or really anything. You have to be really soft and gentle with that new, you know, that new skin from your scar. So same thing with babies. They have that fresh new baby skin. 
they should not be out in the sun. Okay, so you don't you really shouldn't even have to worry about slathering them up until you know they're a little bit older, and hopefully past infancy. All right, so here's where the expiration comes into play. All right, if your sunscreen has expired, you, you want to get one that's not expired, okay? It's obviously going to do more for you and work better for you and, you know, just generally be more effective if it's not expired. So same with medications and food. We don't use those that are expired. So if you kind of go through your sunscreens at home and you see some are 2017, 2016, go ahead and chuck them and then, you know, go out, get something new, maybe make sure you like the smell of it, the texture of it. You know, all of those are things that are going to help you use it a little bit more often. Now, this is really important, especially this time of year. You don't want to buy a combo sunscreen bug repellent, okay? You're going to see them all over the stores. Don't touch them, okay? First of all, the amount of sunscreen that you need is way more than the amount of repellent that you would need. And the reapplication is a lot more than how often you would have to reapply bug repellent, okay? So those should be separate products. You put your sunscreen on, of course, first. And then if you're going outside, use whatever repellent it is that you're using, deep, picaridin, oil of lemon, eucalyptus, whatever it is that you're using to repel ticks and mosquitoes. And you can spray that on the exposed areas of your skin later. You also never put bug spray on your face, but of course, you have to put sunscreen on your face. It's like almost the most important spot, right? Okay? So those are some do's and don'ts. The the heavy rules of sunscreen, okay? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Should the sunscreen burn your eyes? <laughs> no, well, it shouldn't, shouldn't get in your eyes. Well, do you, you know, know like if it sweats through, um, yeah. yeah, that's a bummer. Um, there are some sunscreens um, that are tear free. Yeah, tear free. But I'm also trying to think there are, what you use on your body isn't necessarily what you need to use on your face. Well, there, there are some like facial specific sunscreens. Yeah, they don't they don't have the SPF. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's only fifteen. Okay. There's a Oh, okay. There's like yeah. a copper tone with like a baby on it and it's um, a different texture. And I use that on my face when I go running because it's a whole yeah. different texture and SPF than the rest of my body needs. Yeah. Okay. I have and something I use for my face that. and then it's different than what I use for my body. I know my face stuff is a lot more sensitive and, and skin friendly. It's not but, as um, bad. If you're willing to spend mm -hmm. the money, a lot of them, yeah. facial creams have SPF in it. Yeah. yeah. Just 15, so well, yeah. you can get 30s. Okay, yeah. yeah. I actually I brought this. Um, I brought mm -hmm. this. A lot of times, people will tell me, Oh, there's some you know SPF in my foundation or, or my makeup. And to be honest, the amount of makeup you'd have to apply for the benefits of the SPF is like you're going to the Oscars or something. Yeah. I mean, it's just way too much makeup that's definitely not like a normal summer day. So, this is um, a primer. So, some people use primer on their face first before they apply makeup. So this is like an SPF 30, and this is from a California uh, beach brand. So like surfers use this and stuff like that. But th the good news is there is a lot more out there now. There's also makeup setting sprays that have like SPF 30 or SPF 50 in them. And then like you were saying, a lot of the um, actual facial lotions and creams have SPF, which is, which is good. But you don't wanna rely on like brushing on, you know, like your, you know, quick sweep of powder foundation, that, that really wouldn't be enough. So yeah, that's good. Okay, so let's look at this really quick just in case you guys have an urge to go shopping for some new sunscreen later, okay? So this is a great example of you know, a non-existent brand, but how would you search for your sunscreen? So first thing is, what's the SPF? It's above 30, so good, that's great. Next is it's broad spectrum. They all should say that if they're regulated through the FDA. So that's block out the UVA and the UVB. And it says water resistant, okay? So it's noting that it's not waterproof, it's not sweat proof, okay? And this is 40 minutes, so that's, that's not great, but unfortunately a lot of them are, you know, 40, 60, or 90 minutes. But that's, of course, a decision that you can make when you're 
looking up and down the aisles. And the good news is the stores have tons of options right now since we're like in the season. Okay, and then on the back here, you'll be able to see the directions and all of the ingredients to make sure that it's something that you, you know, want to use. Now, you don't want to forget about your lips. A lot of times lips freckle and they get really dry and, you know, that could partially be from dehydration, but a lot of times it's actually that your lips are, are sunburned. That, that happens all the time. So I do have some SPF lip balms back there. Um, they're very minty, but that'll be good to kind of, you know, keep in your bag for the summer before you go outside, just a little extra protection. And then if you're not going to be wearing a hat, you know, you can spray your hair as well, um, and at least your hairline, but really a hat would be, would be a great option if you can do it, okay? So, quick warning, <laughs> the next picture is an example of someone in the derma scan, okay? So let me pop this up real quick and I'll show you. Oh, wow. Okay, so um, everybody looks a little bit different in the derma scan and that is totally optional, by the way. No one has to participate in that. But it is just kind of a nice kick if you, you know, aren't sure what kind of sun damage you have or, you know, maybe you don't really go to a dermatologist and you just, you're a little curious, okay? But it's not diagnostic at all. I cannot look at her and say, she has skin cancer here, here, and there. I, I can't do that. It's really for you to see your own face. So when I look at her in regular lighting, you know, maybe I see like a couple, a couple marks, couple freckles, but wow, that's a huge difference in there, isn't it? Yeah. So everybody looks a little bit different. Some people just have a couple, some people's faces light up in freckles. Okay, now if you look a little bit purple in here, it's probably makeup. Usually makeup will make it look a little purple, um, especially um, around the eyes and like the nose, basically wherever you have makeup, it might populate that way. So I'll end there, take some questions, and then whoever would like to use the derm scan, we'll, we'll get going with that. Any questions? Yeah. You were saying that uh, to use something that has an SPF, uh, 100 uh, is kind of like staying inside. Is, is, so is that, in other words, not necessary? Oh, no, um, so SPF 100 doesn't exist. So it's saying is don't feel like you have to pay more for a, you know, high SPF item because SPF 30 to 50 is going to do just fine, it, assuming that you're using it in the way that the, the directions are. So you're reapplying it, you're using the amount that you should. That makes me feel better because I do over. I know you were telling me. Yeah. I was like, a hundred. Yes. Here we go, all of you, right in my mouth. I know. Like I sometimes I'll see like SPF eighty out there, and if well, I mean if there's a price difference, a don't feel like. Yeah, I've been foolishly buying it for like twelve dollars. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it's. I mean, being inside near no windows would be That's SPF one hundred. It would just be <laughs> indoor activity because if you think about it, <coughs> when you're driving, a lot of people especially drivers, yeah. mm -hmm. more skin cancers on the left side of their body, yeah. you know, yeah. from the drive. So the sun it goes through glass, through windows, if you read, you know, and like a little nook at your house every day, absolutely. It um, reflects off of snow and ice, so out shoveling people sometimes get a little burn. Skiers have to, you know, wear sunscreen. I know. Yeah, I've been using 100 for the longest yeah. time. A little bit of a, of a misconception with that. And I have read that daughter, so I mm -hmm. covered her for her whole entire yeah. life. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not bad to use. It's just it's not really 100% yeah. protection. Not, yeah. 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 So I've been yeah. spending all of my life. I know. We could have got off cheaper. <laughs> That's okay. We can make changes now. <laughs> we can. All right. Any other questions before we do the germ scan? Sure. Um, have you ever heard if melanoma was detected on the scalp? Because the scalp, we really can't see. You know, we oh. can't really check it ourselves. Sure. Um, the, well, the dermatologist checks it. Yeah, I have one and he won't. Oh, that's yeah, really he, he has given me a referral. He, he won't look me. at your head? No. Who's he referring you to? Yeah. Who's he referring you to? Uh, someone that does. He said, you know, he said, this, well, this just doctor, change over you just him change over this time. little, uh, no, I have to say, your dermatologist should absolutely, honestly, they're checking, they're checking everything. 
everywhere. I mean, my dermatologist looks between my toes. I mean, those are places that she like looks in my lip. I mean, those are places that are, you know who usually finds melanomas? Our hairdressers. <laughs> really? They usually find them and they'll be like, you got something going on, get to the doctor after okay. your haircut. Yeah. But no, doc, the actual doctor, like the dermatologist, they should absolutely check your head. Yeah. And if he doesn't change, yeah. yeah. Because he's not worth it. I had to wait for him for over a year and a half. You were talking about waiting? Oh. I did. A year and a half. Sorry. Yeah, it was when I was working oh, and my co worker said, really? My coworker said I go to the best dermatologist, but right now he's not taking new patients. Yeah. So she would call while she's you know working. She would call like every three months. It was a year and a half that she said I'm so taking. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they can pop up there. Can oh, pop yeah. up. oh, you can head and, and your hair. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Your hair. Oh no. Goes right through. No. no. Any type of skin cancer can be on the head. That's one of the huge. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the sun's beating down right mm -hmm. there. A lot of basal cells. We Wait till I tell him. I was just there. I go twice a year. Okay. And I will go in November. Yeah. Same with May. Well, this month. Yeah. Yeah, I they really should check it everywhere. I know. So, sometimes, yeah. you know, the appointment seems a little invasive, but it's, it is super important to, because, yeah, I mean, you can't check your own head. <laughs> you wouldn't know. Yeah. Yeah, hairdressers. The hairdressers find it. They really do. Around here, maybe two different Yeah, one really is almost like a magnifying glass. Yeah, and the other one just kind of looked it. Yeah, I know it is different. Um, sometimes they have like this little light on like a little thing that they'll kind of glide up and down. Right. Sometimes they just use their eyes. Sometimes. So there's no standard that's good or bad. I don't think so. Um, sometimes you'll have an assistant in the room with you. I don't know, it depends on what practice you go to. And at least I know at mine, they have an iPad and she checks off where, yeah. the, you know, it's like a little person, checks off where the moles are so then at the next visit they can make How know, often, if she yeah. sees one that's suspicious, does she tell you to come back? Well, that's on, on like a case by case basis. Oh, okay. It depends on what it is. Sometimes they will remove stuff right then and there, you know, freeze something off or take something off. And that will do the trick. You know, hey, I think that looks a little weird. Let me zap that off real quick. Takes, you know, yeah. 10 minutes and, and then good to go. They're itchy afterwards. But then sometimes they'll be like, oh, let's make another appointment. And, you know, that's kind of like what you were saying where your discretion comes in. Do you want them to do like a surgery or do you want someone else like a plastic surgeon to do a surgery and that Mose that I was talking about um, this would be something that you get done like outpatient and what they do is they take a little layer of the skin off they send it to pathology okay it comes back still a skin cancer so they go back and they kind of just put a bandage over you go back in take another layer off send it to pathology still cancer do another layer oh we're clean we're good so that's how they can avoid taking a huge chunk out when maybe it's not necessary they just do it like sliver by sliver sounds kind of gross and it can be a little bit of a you know a little bit of a process because they're sending it back and forth to pathology but that that is like a pretty common uh, surgery that they use called Mohs. Yeah. do you know personally of a really excellent one that's local to here um, I can't say that because of like insurance yes. and who you'd be eligible to see but I think between the resources that we have to, to look for them, that we do have a lot of options, but yeah. Yeah, I just didn't know if you, I, I have a list of some I've found. Yeah. It is very individual. You know, doctor I might like may not be for someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, okay. I had one worked on just a couple yeah. weeks ago. Oh, okay. So we're waiting for the results now. Yeah. And what I've had it done before, they, uh, they had to call me and tell me to come back because they didn't get clear edges. Uh, and that's how they explained it. They have to look for a clear edge. So that they've mm -hmm. got it. They got the whole thing taken out. Yeah. So they'll take out not only the cancers, but they take out all the clear mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Stuff. Okay. Yeah. 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 The good news is we can see this on our body, okay? <laughs> so, bottom line, if you notice anything changing, you want to chat with. Your doctor about it and if you don't have a dermatologist yet go to your primary and funny things that I thought 
I mean, you got white spots on you. I have a lot of freckles. I have a lot of freckles. And um, like, we always kid around about the fact that when my freckles join, then I'll have a can. You know, <laughs> not until then. Uh -huh. so, but um, sometimes I have white spots on the arm. And I never worried about them. But the plastic surgeon said, oh, uh, yeah, you need to watch out for the white spots, too. You know, so it's not just the, the dark moles and things, but it's these little white things that are around as well. Little white. And um, he has yeah. up with quite a number of them. Yeah, there's, there's something called like the AKs, the little pre-cancers. Yeah. So sometimes your doctor will give you like a little cream to put on them if you have them, and you're basically freezing them off yourself. Yeah, or he hits them with a laser. Or that, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but whatever you can do to prevent anything from happening really is great with what you're wearing. And honestly, finding a sunscreen that you like and it's the reapplication of it that really makes the difference. But, 